Okay, I'm interviewing Ernie Perez. Today is uh, August the 18th. A nice Monday in San Jose. And uh, Ernie Perez was uh, 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 Ernie Perez was an affirmative action uh, officer in the county of Santa Clara in San Jose, California in the 1970s and 80s. And so uh, let's say hello to Ernie Perez. How, how are you doing, Ernie? I'm very good. Glad to be here with you. Great. Ernie, uh, why don't we start by your telling me just about yourself and uh, your family, your parents, grandparents, yeah. and siblings. But my father and my mother came from, uh, my father and grandfather came from Mexico. Uh, I, I never don't remember my grandfather. But uh, my father came to Mexico, never, never went back, stayed here as a worker, died here in San Jose in 1949. And, uh, my mother's parents and brothers and sisters came from Mexico. Was, she was born in El Paso. So they were, we were a Mexican family and for the first 20 years of our life, we lived primarily as a migrant uh, farm family. We, uh, I've got uh, eight brothers and sisters, and they were born in, I think, eight different cities as we followed the crops around San Jose, around the county, the, the county, the state, and, and ended up here in, in San Jose in 1940, and my dad died in 1949. His brothers grew up here. Do you know what part of Mexico they came from? Yeah, my... Encarnación de Díaz in Aguas Calientes, just outside of Aguas Calientes. My uh, father, believe it or not, didn't know, his, we never celebrated his birthday because he didn't know when he was born. But later, after he passed away, my sister went there and found a record in a hospital, in a, in a uh, church where he'd been baptized and we found out he was born in 1895. Mm -hmm. So he was... Uh, 53 years old when he died. So what what year did uh, the family get to San Jose? We got here about 1940. Right from Mexico? No, no, no. We'd already been uh, farm workers all over the, the state. Uh, all of my brothers and sisters, almost all of us were born in different cities. Uh, in Riverside, Coachella Valley, and different places. But all in California? All in California. All of the brothers and sisters were born in California. You're the oldest, George. I'm the oldest. And uh, as you know, I'm 92 years old. And my youngest, the youngest person is a sister who lives here. Uh, she's uh, 20 years younger. She was married to Mario Cordova, who is a pretty well known. Lamenco Guitaras, who passed away a couple of years ago. So what? when were you born? In May of 1922 in Santa Paula, California. And, uh, you know, we don't remember. We just, we moved every couple of years. <laughs> we had a very happy life. I've given you a book that has the history of the family and what we did. and. Uh, Today we know that we were poor. We didn't know we were poor then. We were happy. We had plenty to eat. <laughs> we had a father that never quit. So, uh, so where did you live in San Jose? Where did we live? When, when you were a young kid. Well, when we first came in, we went to what is it called San Cipuedes, uh, rented a place there, and later somewhere else in San Jose, and then we finally bought our. our First home in 1944 <clears throat> was by then I was 22 years old in Royal Avenue in San Jose, uh, an older home in those days, four thousand five hundred dollars. First home we ever had that had a living room. We remember that, <laughs> and we bought <laughs> we bought my mother a refrigerator. <laughs> Later we had a telephone. <laughs> we lived a good life. We, we really did. We didn't know. Uh, we didn't know we were on the lower scale of things. So where'd you go to school? Uh, just uh, I only went till sixteen because the the sad part was that my father, uh, unlike others, that 
when I was 15, he'd say, uh, well, I'll be glad next year when you're 16 and can quit school and help and need help with a family. And so I quit school at 16. Uh, at that time, I was going to Escondido, California, but we went different places, you know. Not good schooling. Uh, and, and only my three sisters completed high school initially. And uh, none of the boys, but uh, but as you'll see later, they uh, just great country to us. We all had good lives here. What kind of a student were you? A student? Yeah. Absolutely poor, because I knew I was going to quit school, so I didn't take anything that was difficult. And plus, that our uh, counselors seemed to think that. Mexicanos did get good jobs and they liked us to do woodworking and make bookends. And that's it, very poor. Uh, no algebra, no little English, nothing that was difficult. What were you interested in when you were a teenager? We really didn't have nothing, we just worked. <laughs> we worked all the time, but we went from house to house selling watermelons, selling cheese, uh, I don't know, we, did, uh, we didn't have much of a social life, but it wasn't an unhappy life, it was a happy And our relatives were that way too, though. We got relatives in uh, Antioch and in Los Angeles, and, and they all, they, their children have all done very well. Not, you know, not as high as those of you that went to college and whatnot, but but very well. The paper I've given you tells you, uh, for example, here in San Jose, four of my cousins were police officers in the city of San Jose. One of them was a uh, retired deputy uh, sheriff of the county. And, and our kids have really done a little different matter. My, uh, I think my grandchildren are all, uh, they're all college graduates. They're, they're, it's, it's close to 100%. Uh, and as I told you, you mentioned that you'd gone to USC. My second son went to USC through the Air Force, became a doctor. Then my older son, who didn't, he didn't do well in school, but got, he uh, did well in, in the law enforcement area. And he just now retired last week after serving nine years as director of the uh, first Department of Homeland Security, Port at Del Rio, Texas. And incidentally, his sons, one of them is the NICE agent, which is the Immigration and Customs. And the other guy is a university of, uh, graduate of the uh, University of Texas. So they've done, I think, comparable to uh, the country's been good to them, to all of us, really, because even those of us when I, the reason I tell you this in that paper I give you, one thing that I've always found just maddening is the concept that uh, apparently some people that are against a comprehensive immigration program, they contend that to let these undocumented immigrants settle here is creating a permanent underclass of undereducated people that will be a burden on the United States schools, health. And as you'll see in the paper, it hasn't been true in our family. And, and we had a, my father never went to school at all in Mexico or America. My mother went three years in America. And well, they didn't immediately rise. I think we've all been fortunate, I hope. We hope that our great grandchildren are as fortunate. I think I told you in my case, I, uh, I, three of us, the three oldest in our family, I was uh, then 20, and had a brother 18, and one 17. And we did what I think Chicanos did all over the place. We volunteered to go fight. And my dad did let us know that uh, even though he was not a citizen, that he considered America to be his country, and he was proud that we went. And my relatives are all that way. We, uh, I, I don't really know any relatives that were drafted. And, you know, so those are my, 
feeling the way I feel strongly that uh, the undocumented immigrants are probably people like you, given the chance 10, 15 years from now, they'll be up and they're not going to be lawn mowers and house workers and they may be that for the first generation, but, uh, but uh, the ones I know, uh, most have done well. Ernie, you were talking about you and your brothers all going into the military service voluntarily. Tell me about uh, that. Well, there were only three of us. The, uh, take the youngest one first, he was only 17. He joined the Navy, and they quickly put him, he ended up being a, a crewman on an assault boat, and he was in Iwo Jima in that attack as a crew member bringing Marines. And when the war ended, he got out. He was only 19. The other brother was turned down because of massive hernias, and he went and joined the uh, Merchant Marine and said, and he ended up, but in fact, he's a guy that ended up saving enough money for us to buy a house later. He ended up in all the combat areas uh, as a merchant mariner. And then in my case, I uh, joined the Air Force and I got into the flying program, which the, at that time they no, did not require college. They required only an aptitude test. And I, uh, I joined in, I think, February of 42, somewhere in there. Uh, ended up, uh, went to pilot training at first, didn't do too good, didn't. and then they told me that my aptitude test showed I could uh, qualify to go to navigation school, and I went so that in April of 1944, I was... Hang on. Let's wait for that to pass. Okay, go, go, go back to you went in and you went to a navigator. Yeah, and I went to, graduated from navigation school at Hondo, Texas in April of 44 and was given a commission as a second lieutenant. Then assigned to a combat crew training in B-24s or four-engine bombers. And uh, we went to England. And luckily, by luck, we went to a real good established 93rd bomb group and uh, we got there in September 44 and stayed there till the war ended in May of 45 and in my case uh, I flew 15 missions first as just a navigator with a the crew and then later I had broken a leg on a ground accident not shoot not fighting and I had been taken off a crew for a while and then later I was utilized only as a lead crew navigator replacement guy. So then I flew at least more memorable. My last eight missions were pretty memorable in that uh, well, a couple of them were for say 45 aircraft and three or four were for 100 aircraft and on one mission was 400 aircraft for the lead navigator. And uh, of course I, and then the war ended and the, uh, the Air Force announced and let everybody, they asked everybody to declare, you want out or you want to stay in? It seemed to me that about eight out of ten wanted out. But not me, I was a first lieutenant then. And it was a great life. <laughs> I didn't want to come back here to work in farms. And, and I opted to stay in. When, when I must forget to say though, I ended up falling in love with a British babe in England and got married in 45, left her there. It took her a year to catch up with me. And after I got back, uh, just a variety of interesting good assignments. My initial assignment was one year with the Colombian Air Force where I taught their first navigators. And, oh, and then read flying jobs of some, I would spend a year, in, eight months in the Berlin airlift. Um, and then, uh, oh, meanwhile, I knew that that I wasn't going to be retained in the Air Force as a high school dropout. <laughs> so I, when I went to Columbia, I wrote my high school in Escondido, California. I asked them, what do I do to get a diploma? Others said, 
So they gave me a couple correspondence courses, and then they gave me a diploma. It was about when I was 28 years old or so. And then later on, I began to go to night school in Europe and my assignments in Europe, and went to the University of Maryland to night classes, etc. Eventually, I get to Sacramento in the navigation school. They had a bootstrap program where if you could graduate from college in a semester, they let you go full time. So I went and I went to Sacramento State College and got a BA degree in uh, public administration. And things then favored out. Then I got a letter from the Air Force saying, you like going to school, offering you the opportunity to go to Stanford full time with a bunch of other people, 80 or 90 of us. So I went to Stanford and got a master's degree in uh, political science. Now I was hoping to get some nice job with working with Latin American people, and, but, but the Cold War was on and they needed crew members. And we got crew assignments, but it turned out good to me when I went to Stanford while I was there. I went there as a captain. While I was at Stanford, I got promoted to, to major. And I was given a regular commission, which I don't know if you know, it'd be like statutory in the school system, and, uh, and and promoted to major. I mean, so when I went in, the, then I flew as a crew member on a uh, six-engine B-47 throughout the Cold War as a navigator bombardier, and that's where I got promoted to lieutenant colonel. And after that, I finished out different assignments, uh, different uh, planning thing and spent my last year in Vietnam. So Stanford was in what years? 57 or 58, somewhere in there. 58, I think. 57, 58. Only went for 18 months, but it was, you know, they did, the, uh, they allowed 90 of us to go there. You as a, as a college professor, now you might be interested in knowing what did happen to us and toward, toward the end, my advisor then, the political science director type, said he, they were ha he, he was having trouble with other teachers at Stanford because they had uh, some teachers that found, found that, that most of us were people like me that didn't have much qualification, but good qualifications. And at Stanford in those days, I guess today too, you had to be an A minus student to get in. And they, they thought they were going to refuse to go participate in the program. He said, he told he said, I, I told him I couldn't do it with them because uh, none of you failed. <laughs> they graded us. See, by being an outside group, they just merely would establish great scores on the regular students who were all in their day, at top soon, and we were great, and we did. I never, like even me, would, uh, who would not finish high school, and, uh, I never got to see you know, the others, maybe A's and B's, and so did all of us. It just showed you that we just had the motivation that, that well, we were getting paid to go there, and we knew that uh, that it would end up with probably better assignments. Were there other Latinos in the program with you? No, there weren't too many Latinos in the Air Force. Although there were guys that I really admired, I, I seldom ran into Latinos. And that's because of the educational requirements again to find training. But when I was at the school at, Ma at Mather, they had a, a group of B-52 pilots. And they had three Latino aircraft commanders in the B-52s, as I remember. But, but it was very, they weren't big numbers. But, but because of that, you know, uh, I think later, you, you know, here that, uh, did you know, you know who Dele Alvarez is here? Yes. He, you know, her brother was the longest ago, mm -hmm. right? so that was the new incoming group. Huh? He went to University of Santa Clara and became a pilot and then got shut down and guys like that, but they were pretty rare. Not many, but they were, and the ones that I knew were good. <laughs> to clarify, uh, Ernie's talking about Ed Alvarez 
from San Jose who was a pilot and got shot down in Vietnam. Everett, yeah, Everett. Ever, Everett. Uh, he got shot down in Vietnam. He was a prisoner of war for a number of years. Yeah, he wrote a book recently, and I, I don't know if you read it, he wrote a book about his time spent as a prisoner of war. And then his sister, I worked with his sister in Santa Clara County. His sister ended up as a pretty high level position. Huh? Ernie's talking about Delia Alvarez, and what uh, what did she do? When I first met her, she was uh, just a management analyst in the county exec's office. Uh, sometime after that, she got appointed as a director of personnel. In fact, Delia was interviewed me for becoming the, the uh, director of the county's affirmative action program, equal opportunity program. And she served three or four years as the personnel director. And then they, I don't know quite the title, it was kind of a medical thing. She went to a higher level and, and retired out of there. Impressive lady. I think she was the, um, I think she was the, um, I think Delia Alvarez ended up becoming the public health director, that director yeah, that's for the Santa Clara County. Which was County. a higher level, in, uh, and, and, uh, and up to that time only being healed by a doctor. Yeah, she became, that's what she ended up as her last job. Okay, Ernie, so uh, after a long career in the military, you retired and you ended up here in San Jose. Tell me about the process of retiring, then how did you end up here, and as, the positions you began to look at in the local area. Well, as I said, we moved here in 1940. My dad died in 49. Uh, My mother then had the two three younger brothers and she left here, and I wanted to be near them. I mean, that's, that's why we wanted to make could, could make San Jose my home. And I, I happened to see job announcements of a job open in Santa Clara County, and I applied. And where were you living at the time? In Sacramento, which is where I got out. I, I was in the military, and I got out of the Air Force at Mather Air Force Base, which is a U.S. Navigation School Air Force. And so when I was there, I applied for this job. I got a, a rather little, I, mean, I was given a job as a management analyst, as a, mainly a project officer, working on helping get implement what was to be the county's first affirmative action plan, which was a plan that a community group had proposed to the Board of Supervisors who accepted it and they adopted it. And, and, and I, got a job working as a, as a staff member of the guy that was given the job of uh, getting that program underway. And I worked at that for two years. Then as I told you, uh, a higher level program manager one uh, opened up in the Santa Clara County Transportation Agency where... Um, excuse me, your, your hand is in your face. So. Oh yeah, uh, the Santa Clara County Transportation Agency was required by the Urban Mass Transit Administration to have to appoint an affirmative action coordinator and to actually prepare and adopt an affirmative action plan and a minority business enterprise program. They had to have it. And I went and talked to the director there and told him that I, you know, what I'd been doing in the county and and he, uh, he appointed me as uh, the affirmative action coordinator. Very pleasant job getting and working in all those areas, writing their plans. And, so. and five years later, the county up the, the established the director of equal opportunity division in the county, which is just a higher level program manager three. 
and I applied for that and got it and stayed in that position for the next 10 years and, uh, and finally decided to retire from the county in 1990 and the years have gone by since here in San Jose. So you went to work for the county in about 1980? I went to work for them in 1974. Okay, that's when you were a management analyst. Yeah. It's okay, 74. Like, yeah, and I just stayed in the county, yeah. All these jobs were under the county. Exactly. Right, and, and then yeah. you became the uh, affirmative action I worked for two years in board. that. Five years as a director of as a affirmative action coordinator in nine, that was 1980 up to 1980, then up to I worked as a director of Equal Opportunity Division till 90, and then retired. Okay, so uh, being the director of uh, is it Equal Opportunity? Excuse equal me, Opportunity. Is. Okay, so as affirmative action coordinator for the county of Santa Clara, what did you do and what was going on around you as far as the community, the Latino and minority community uh, in the area? Well, obviously the first thing I did, I had to personally write an updated, more comprehensive affirmative action plan it was adopted by the board and then subsequently wrote new plans every two or three years. The plans merely established uh, what the composition of the total workforce and, 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 and the purpose was to carry out the county board of supervisors policy or hope was that the county would eventually have a workforce that mirrored the community in terms of sex and ethnic backgrounds, believing that that was essential not only to give equal opportunity to all people, but for the county to do its job correctly. And while there is where I had the good fortune to meet Jack Brito, who was the assistant director of the Mexican American Community Services Agency. And they they worked on their own off the, with board members, city council members, uh, to adopt and pursue to try to get a greater increased representation of of peak minorities, especially in in uh, positions involving public contact like policemen, social workers they themselves. You know, we didn't do the hiring. That is a long, slow process. Oh, and a minority business enterprise program. When I became the went to a transportation agency, less than 5% of the county's money on project went to minority contractors. By the time we left and had our program well underway, it was over 25% went to them, which was very good. And, uh, so that was, uh, we did not have hiring authority, we did not have quotas, we, you know, you didn't appoint somebody just to, but you, certainly worked at, uh, and the board was great and that they themselves uh, firmly believed that uh, they needed a county sheriff's department that uh, reflected the community that they needed in the hospital people of, and, and particularly in those days, Hispanics were a little over 20% of the population and, and were pretty represented initially very slowly, but up to today, things are much different. Great. So, Ernie, as the affirmative action coordinator of the county in the, essentially the 1980s, uh, who were other Latinos who were in positions of leadership in city, county uh, government? You know, really, we had uh, several board members that came there, namely, uh, and then one of the board members, I forget, you probably know his name, he went on to become the mayor of San Jose for two terms. Who's that? Uh, 
essentially what. Uh, Ron, you're talking about Ron Gonzalez. Yeah, Ron Gonzalez. Yeah, he was a board member in the. Uh, and uh, there was a. Another one that I only knew in passing, who passed, passed away long ago, who used to enjoy talking to him as a board member because he had been in the Air Force, had been a pilot, and had flown in the famous Ploesti Raid, you know. But there weren't many. There weren't probably a Who are you talking about? You said elected officials. No, uh, no, no, but just who are you talking about? This you person know, who was also an Air is, Force officer. Uh, there he goes, Calvo Victor. Calvo, what was his first name? Victor? Mm. Well, what was he? He was a board member. Of the county board of education? Uh, board of supervisors. supervisors. Okay. You mentioned uh, a few people at the city of San Jose. You, you better tell you about well, you stop that a minute. There's a guy okay, that Okay, I know, but I'm not I, interviewing I, I, I know, him. I'm interviewing I know. you. Okay. Jack was the guy that okay. knows. But I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in you right now. Yeah. Back to who did you know at the city? City of San Jose. Not, not, to, not working with the guy I knew well was Rafael Jimenez, of course. And who was he? Oh, he was, uh, he was a, the, an affirmative action officer. Another job, he, I guess he ran or worked with model cities. Uh, he was one, but there were a number in the city. I just didn't know most of them. We had our own little world in the county. <laughs> uh, were there many? Latinos who were in the police department, uh, sheriff's department, probation department, city parks and recreation, anything like that? Well, the sheriff's department's the one I knew best. They were, when I went there, there were less than 5% when the, the hope for representation should have been 20. They eventually threw in, and, and people like your friend Brito had a lot to do with convincing the sheriff to to push, to recruit, to encourage, so that today, you're, at least in the city and the county sheriff's department, and I'm going to guess at the police department, they're pretty well represented today, but it was a slow process over the period of 20 to 30 years. It was, there was never a time when you said, hey, we're going to hire the next five Hispanics. It wasn't done that way. It was, they get out and recruit them, get them to... And you may know that at that time the Hispanic community itself didn't realize that, that uh, being a policeman, a fireman, a social worker were great professions. And they themselves didn't realize the opportunities that would be available in there. When they did, slow process. Uh, and I, I think many of those goals have, have been attained, you know. You mentioned model cities uh, a minute ago. What what was model cities? You know, I, I didn't know it well. Blito would tell you that when you interview him. He knew it, but whatever. It did. Do you have anything to do with any of the no, people involved in me. model it's cities? Not uh, it's just uh, well, like what I considered achievements or, or hope that I contributed to it. The Minority Business Enterprise Program to me was one of the greatest successes of all because when I went there, the transportation agency had three to five percent participation, and for a good reason. The most Latino contractors were small, weren't known. White contractors didn't know them and didn't really think you know, had confidence. But as we progressed and published a directory of contractors and and required not that they award contracts, but required that they invite X number of bids. If you're painters, you invite three bids. If you want some concrete, you invite. And we did, hope we did not go into the quota things, which is really found the problem in the guy. And anyway, slowly it turned to, in time, uh, the white contractor community soon found that there were a lot of competitive minority firms out there, and if they got bids from them, it increased their likelihood of getting government contracts, because the contracts are always given to the lowest responsible bidder. So by the time we left, we assumed that it was good. Uh, we were getting just routinely 25 or 30 percent instead of 3 to 4 or 5 percent. Who were some of the uh, 
Latino contractors in those days. Well, Rosa Din is one of the famous. Uh, that's still in being right now. There were a lot of them. Uh, Rosenden was the, the real famous big one. There were others. Uh, even I think I told you today, my nephew runs uh, NorCal Floors. Uh, there are many small contractors. But they can't compete on big or could compete on big projects. With, uh, but but it got to the point where the big contractors. But but we did to make it easy. We published a booklet that we'd give a contractor with a. But a big contractor like the one five million dollar contract given out in the county hospital, ten big contractors filled out the documents. In my office, we immediately wrote, or first of all, we'd already developed a minority director thing that had the names of maybe a hundred minority and female owned businesses. And we gave this to the major contractor and, and we established that requirement, no quota, but you must invite to bid. And then carried it one step further. I would write a letter to the minority contractors saying, hey, this bid's there and here's the names of 10 guys that have drawn the documents. Only one is going to get the contract because it's the lowest bidder. So I recommend to you that you bid to all 10. And they did and uh, had great results. He said, you know, by the end, uh, it, it, in fact, uh, the success of this thing, I'll be glad to give you a copy of it later, it was written up in the, uh, by Dr. Bunzel and uh, got published in the New York Times. Of the, I think the title of his big report they published was Affirmative Action Hurting No One. When you said Dr. Bunzel, I'm thinking of um, when he was president of San Jose State. Yeah. Was, he, was he in that position or a different position when he wrote the article? In the no, he was times. already out, and when he was, uh, when he was, when we heard of him, we heard him. He was kind of, in my opinion, uh, impression was pretty again, contrary to affirmative action. What happened when he wrote the article? I don't know if he's still there. He went to this writing group in uh, Stanford. Yeah, I'm an uh, ex-police chief, uh, and and I happened to read an article where Bunzel had written that uh, contractors were trying to get all the different counties and cities to bar, to not not have minority business enterprise programs because they claimed they made them use people that weren't too qualified, was the cost thing, da 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 was well on. And I wrote Bunzel then as, from my position in the county, saying, hey, that's not the way it's working, and gave him what we had. I said, here's the beauty of what's happened here. We're not doing it that way, and it's very successful. And lo and behold, I guess he was good. He wrote, wrote it up our way. But that's what he was then. Next time I'll send you, just for your info, I'll send you a copy of it. I don't know if Jack has got the handy that I've given him one. <laughs>